Welcome to 2819. I'm Sandra Dimas. And I'm Brian Rombacher. And we have a great show for you today. Tell them what we've got today, Brian. That's right. In RTB 101, Crystal will be interviewing philosopher and theologian Ken Samples about life-changing books. Ooh, I like books. I'm excited for that segment. Also, in Give and Take, Jeff Swank will be talking with the strong astronomer Hugh Ross, and he's going to be explaining oxygen. Sounds simple. But first up is culture talk. Sandra's going to be interviewing biochemist Buzz Rana about a topic I'm very interested in. Is anti-aging technology a blessing or a curse? Let's check it out. Welcome to Culture Talk, where we talk about how culturally relevant topics can be used to start conversations about the Christian faith. I'm joined today with Fuzzle Rana, biochemist and co-author of Humans 2.0, a scientific, philosophical, and theological perspective on transhumanism. Thank you for joining us, Fuzz. Sandra, thanks for having me. That was a mouthful, but uh, I got your title out. And you know what? We're here to talk about something very near and dear to my heart, and that is anti-aging technology. <laughs> so, um, you know, that is something that, um, especially here in the U.S., uh, we were very concerned about aging and looking young and youthful. And uh, so when you have written about anti-aging and anti-aging technology, I'm like, okay, where do I sign up? This is, this is a very interesting topic. Um, but you've written quite extensively on biotechnology. And most recently in your article about anti-aging, you ask whether, whether scientists should actually turn back the hands of time. So first, can you give us an understanding of the research that prompted your recent article? Yeah, you know, well, this idea of uh, anti-aging technology, I think for, for many people uh, is really viewed as something that is kind of pseudoscientific claims, you know, about products that really don't uh, truly deliver. But the fact of the matter is there are biogerontologists who are actively looking for ways to reverse the aging process. And recently a team from Israel did a really interesting study where they were using hyperbaric oxygen, basically administering 100% oxygen over the course of 90 minutes uh, for the span of two months uh, for 35 test subjects who were all over 65 years of age. And after going through that regime, they noticed that there were a couple of markers, uh, biological markers that reflect biological age that actually were reversed, indicating that even though these uh, test subjects spent two months in the study, at the end of the study, biologically, they were actually younger than when they began the study. And so for the, one of the first times in, in, rec you know, in recorded scientific literature, we see an actual reversal of the aging process. Wow, that is some really cool stuff. So, you know, it, to me, that all sounds exciting. Um, so can you tell us first about kind of the exciting part, and then we'll delve into maybe some of the concerns. Um, so what would this technology do to help slow or reverse the aging process on like a broader scale? Yeah, well, you know, I think, first of all, it, this kind of technology does offer the, the prospects of allowing all of us to live longer healthier lives of, of high quality. Uh, but on top of that, many of the serious diseases uh, that you know, inflict people like cancer and, and different types of cardiovascular disorders, type two diabetes, dementia, Alzheimer's as examples, are actually, cor are actually correlate with age, where age is considered to be one of the greatest risk factors for these diseases. And, in fact, there are some people who think aging itself is what prompts or triggers the onset of these diseases. So if we can reverse the aging process, we can mitigate quite a bit of pain and suffering that people are experience going through these horrific diseases, but also in a, at, a, at a societal scale, this could dramatically reduce medical uh, expenses, medical costs, because a lot of the, the cost of medicine is actually end of life care where people again have these types of diseases and disorders. So that all sounds really good, you know, helping people um, just to ease human suffering and to lower medical costs. That all sounds like good stuff. So why would we be concerned about some of these technologies? 
Well, you know, people that are pursuing the, the anti-aging agenda uh, actually are having, actually have this vision that not only would we extend life expectancy, maybe tens of years, but maybe hundreds of years where people are literally talking about uh, at one, one day humans living to be several hundred years old. And when you have that kind of dramatic increase in life expectancy, now suddenly you're, you're changing the very nature of who we are as human beings, because the process of aging is very much part of, how, of who we are and how we experience life. But on top of that, you're looking at wide scale economic changes, because you know, to live that long means you've got to have the monetary resources throughout the duration of your life, which means you're going to be working for hundreds of years. And now suddenly, you know, you're looking at losing, you know, job opportunities for the people in the next generation, you know, uh, or you're looking at large scale societal changes, because if people are living that long and death rates now drop, that means you're going to have pressure on the limited resources in the world, which now means you're either going to have to curtail births or the anti-aging technology will only be available to select people that maybe these are people who as a society we deem are worth living hundreds of years, or maybe it's for only the wealthy. So there's all kinds of ethical issues that arise when we start thinking about extending life expectancy. Yeah, you know, those are things that I think you do a really good job of expressing in your book, Humans 2.0, because it all on on the front side of it sounds so exciting to have anti-aging, to live longer and to live a healthier life. So we're not just living longer, but we have more energy and um, we're able to just be um, healthier for a longer period of time. That all sounds great. But then when you start talking about job opportunities and talking about accessibility and lack of accessibility for people who aren't um, as well off financially, like then it becomes kind of clear what those ethical concerns are. You also talk in your book though about a false gospel. Um, so people might be wondering how would you get from transhumanism to a false gospel? Can you, can you explain that? Well, th this idea of transhumanism in a nutshell is this movement that argues that we should be using science and technology to overcome our biological limits as human beings. And the chief limit that we all face is our own mortality. And so transhumanists are looking to science and technology as kind of a vehicle for salvation, if you will, where science and technology can save us, can give us practical immortality. So anti-aging technology fits and fuels the, uh, the, the transhumanist agenda. And so, but simply looking at, again, all these different ethical issues makes it very clear that, that science and technology can't save us because technology is always a double-edged sword. There are true benefits, but there are also real costs. And those costs are, are, are such that you're never going to have technology be able to truly rescue us from our predicament. Yeah, and that, that's a really good point. So let's say we're talking then to um, a non-Christian and they are all for easing human suffering. How do we have a conversation about transhumanism that is compassionate and shows that we too want to ease human suffering, but we're also bringing up these ethical concerns? Like, how would you have that conversation? Well, you know, to me, I, I would not view somebody who is, is, is pursuing transhumanism as necessarily an enemy. Because at the end of the day, what is being expressed is this fundamental need that we all have as human beings, which is hope, purpose, and destiny, and that we see the world as the, it, 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 that the world isn't the way it's supposed to be, that, that death is unnatural. And so transhumanists are trying to solve these problems with technology, whereas the gospel is offering us a different type of solution, namely in, in the, the hope that we have in the person of Christ. And so, but yet, you know, this is a wonderful bridge, I think, to the gospel and, you know, hopefully allows people to see the spiritual dimension of their need and how the gospel can fill it. Yeah, well, thank you so much for that, Fuzz. It's a pretty deep topic. So if you are interested in hearing more about this topic, go to reasons.org and search for transhumanism. You can also search for anti-aging. Thanks again for joining.
Now it's time for RTB 101, where we discuss practical questions to equip you to share your faith more effectively. And here to help me talk about what I think is a very fun topic is theologian and philosopher Kenneth Samples. Welcome, Ken. Good to be with you, Krista. It's the new year and it's still January. We could talk about the new year, right? Oh, right. Um, let's talk about books. I know you love books. I'm curious, how many books did you read last year? You know, I typically try to read two a week, which will put me right about a hundred. Some years it's more or less, depending if I'm writing a book, but I try to get in at least two books a week to put me right at the hundred, hundred books per year. So as you're doing that, I'm sure you sometimes, if you're like me, you might make friends with your books, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. that there's favorites. Do you ever revisit books and, and reread them? Yes. Uh, in fact, the last number of years, Krista, I've, I've spent a lot of time kind of reading classic books or rereading classic books. And so uh, I'll make notes in the margins. And a lot of times I'll just go back and, and read my notes that I have that I have placed in the book itself. Mm. I'm curious, what are your thoughts about why books are important in the life of the Christian. I can imagine that some of our viewers might be thinking, well, shouldn't I just focus on reading the Bible? Why would I want to read classic books? Yeah. Well, I certainly want to encourage people to read God's word. The Bible is the greatest of all books because it is divinely inspired. It is a revelation from God. Uh, but we should read books because... Uh, Book reading uh, develops the life of the mind, and uh, we're to love God with our entire being, and that includes the remarkable gift of the mind. And so even though other books are not inspired the way Scripture is, uh, great books, in, in the words of Mortimer Adler, the great educator, he said great books are great because you can never exhaust them. You can, you can never get to the end of them, so to speak. And uh, I think that gives us the ability to discover truth, goodness, and beauty, which are, which are characteristics that flow from God. That makes me think that not all books are of equal quality. They, they shouldn't all get the same level of attention. Is, is that kind of what I hear you say? Yeah, very much so. Uh, in, in fact, I would say that a lot of the books, maybe even most of the books, maybe you should just skim them. Uh, it's skim only reading. The, that's right. It's okay. Kind of a, pre-reading where you would skim them, kind of read them quickly or just summarize them, and you would save your analytical time where you're reading from page one to the end of the book, a very careful read, you would, you would save those for the really good books that will really push you and help you to grow. And I'm thinking maybe another tip is to push ourselves, you know, to build on that of reading books that challenge us. Maybe we don't always want to read books that are easy or that we understand everything. Maybe sometimes it's good to read something that's a little, a little higher than what I feel like I can grasp. That's a, absolutely right. Um, if you want, really want to grow, if you want your, if you want to revolutionize your intellectual life, you need to read books that are over your head. And I recommend classic books to people. And sometimes they'll come back and say, you know, Professor Samples, that was really hard. It was over my head. And I say, good. Those are the kinds of books that will really challenge you, and you'll see a real difference in your in your cognitive thinking and understanding. Well, now that makes me wonder, are there any books that have really made a lasting impression on you? Like you you walked away after reading that book and you were changed. You were you were never the same. Yeah, there's a number of them have that have done that. Uh, when when I was first a Christian, I kind of grew up in a nominal Catholic family, was not a careful reader as a, as a young person. The first Christian book that I read was Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. That really transformed me. It, it, it taught me uh, how a careful Christian scholar thinks about various issues. So it, was, it helped me in my doctrinal thinking. Uh, other books that have done that similarly, Krista, Confessions by St. Augustine is a remarkable book uh, that has challenged the very depths of my Christian uh, views. And uh, 
Uh, and I'll tell you another book that transformed me. It's, it's How to Read a Book by Mortimer Adler. I mean, I learned to read very early. My mother taught me to read, but Adler's book, it just revolutionized my intellectual life. It taught me to think about things and to organize my reading uh, that, that really changed my life. And I, I recommend all of those particular books to our readers today. Well, that's really great. And maybe we can challenge our viewers in the new year to set some academic goals and that academic goals can fit with spiritual goals and uh, to challenge themselves to, to read some books this year. And thanks for those great suggestions. And I do want to encourage all our viewers, go check out Ken's blog. It's called Reflections. And you can search for that at the Reasons to Believe website. Just go to reasons.org. Hello, Jeff Zwerink here. Welcome back to Give and Take, the segment of our show where we explore important scientific ideas and see how they relate to the truth of Christianity. Today, I'm joined again by founder and president of Reasons to Believe, Dr. Hugh Ross, and we're going to be looking and trying to understand why does Earth have so much oxygen in its atmosphere? Hugh, it's good to have you here today. Thank you for having me back. So when we look out, one of the, the basic features of Earth is it's got this very large component of oxygen, about 20% oxygen in its atmosphere. And it, and it just seems kind of obvious that it's there. Um, how do we go about understanding where this oxygen came from in our atmosphere? Well, there's lots of evidence that the oxygen in our atmosphere comes from photosynthetic light. But the problem is, as uh, you know, this photosynthetic light produces oxygen, it gets continually absorbed uh, by the animals. It gets continually absorbed by other plants. And also it gets uh, uh, sucked up into the minerals that make up the core of the earth. And so yeah, for 3.8 billion years, we've had photosynthetic light pumping oxygen in the atmosphere, but it's removed almost as rapidly as it's produced. Uh, and so there's been a, an enigma. How is it that we have all this oxygen in the atmosphere and why do we see these sudden jumps in the oxygen content in the atmosphere? Because if you get a sudden jump, then it seems to stabilize again, and you get another jump. And so that's kind of what's new. We now have a deep understanding of how that happens. So, so that's pretty fascinating because oxygen, it just seems basic to life, or at least uh, human life, if you will. And so uh, kind of there's this default position of, oh, it's just been around a long time. But, but you're saying something pretty important there is that there's things that produce oxygen, but there's also, I know oxygen to be a pretty reactive element. And so there's a lot of things that absorb it from the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. um, so has Earth had oxygen in its, his or in its atmosphere for most of its history? Well, it's had oxygen in its atmosphere for most of the history of life on planet Earth. Uh, but for most of that history, it's been at a very low abundance level. And uh, you know, we refer to the great oxygenation events that basically bumped up the oxygen content. And because you've got photosynthetic light continuously existing on the Earth, if you bump up the oxygen content, it doesn't drop back down. It stays up, and then you get another bump and we now understand what bumps it up. Okay, so if you look, so if you go back over the four and a half billion year history or 3.8 billion years where there's been abundant life, you've got very low levels of oxygen and then you see these stepwise increases. Uh, how many of these steps can we identify at this point in time? Well, we can identify four and the new research basically gives us an understanding of the first two of these great oxygenation events. So, so kind of give us the time scale of when did they happen? And if we start from very low levels and get up to roughly 20% oxygen in the atmosphere, roughly when did they occur and what were the sizes of the steps, if you will? Well, 2.4 billion years ago is when you get the first great oxygenation event. And that's where you go from, say, one thousandth of a percent oxygen in the atmosphere, where it jumps up to somewhere between one and two and a half percent. And the other big one you get is about uh, 580 million years ago, where it jumps up from about 1 or 2% up to 8%. And then you get one where it jumps up to 10%, and another one where it jumps up to the current 20 to 21%. 
Okay, so let's kind of dig in. How do we understand how these oxygenation events happen? I mean, you, you said that you've got photosynthetic synthetic organisms producing all of this oxygen. So why is it that these steps occurred? Well, like we go to the first two great oxygenation events, what we see is that there's this enormous uh, push of continental landmass material into the oceans. So you get this huge amount of eroded material or catastrophically ma uh, dumped material into the oceans. And because of the plate tectonics, uh, this stuff is being subducted uh, into the mantle of the earth. And uh, what is new is they now understand uh, that as you get this great huge dumping of uh, continental landmass material in the ocean, within that is a lot of organic carbon. And so this now gets subducted uh, into the uh, mantle. And when it's being subducted, you have all this dissolved water and dissolved carbon dioxide uh, that's in this uh, continental material. And then when it gets subducted into the mantle, a chemical reaction occurs where that dissolved water and dissolved carbon dioxide uh, becomes uh, formaldehyde and oxygen. And then the formaldehyde gets broken down into carbon and water. And how they discovered this is they were finding stuff coming up on the mantle that was pure carbon, graphite and diamonds. And it was like, how do we get all these diamonds and graphite coming up from the mantle? Well, it's because of this chemical reaction that occurs uh, when you get this huge amount of uh, you know, organic material uh, being subducted uh, into the earth. And we now have good geological evidence that indeed there was a massive infusion of continental landmass material uh, 2.4 billion years ago. And another one that you find in all the geology textbooks, it's called the Great Unconformity. Uh, when you again have this huge landslides all over the earth, dumping huge amounts of continental landmass material uh, into the oceans about 580 million years ago. And, uh, you know, with that transformation of water and carbon dioxide uh, into formaldehyde and oxygen, you get this big pulse of oxygen uh, being released through volcanoes uh, into the atmosphere, and that causes these big jumps that you see in the oxygen content. So, so that's that's actually very fascinating because if I understand what you're saying, um, there are things on the surface of the Earth that are producing oxygen, but you also have these sinks where carbon is reacting with the oxygen and forming carbon dioxide or something. But as that is subducted deep into the Earth, there are processes at play there that actually sequester the carbon deep in the Earth and bring the oxygen back up to the surface. So you've got the photosynthetic production of oxygen, but you also have this a biological production of oxygen uh, that is enhancing or bumping up the, the process. So it's actually the entire, entire functioning of the earth that is making the oxygen, if you will. Is that what you're saying? Well, they both have a biotic origin because what you've got is a lot of dead organic material that's been buried into the earth on the continents. And you've got these massive tectonic events that pull all that into the ocean. And then it gets subducted but the net factor is you get this huge release of oxygen uh, from that material, and you also get diamonds. So, hey, I know your wife has a, a, a wedding ring, and there's a diamond there, and uh, that diamond wouldn't be there unless this kind of tectonic reaction was going on. Well, thanks, you. I appreciate your comments. You know, we do take oxygen for granted here on Earth because without it, we wouldn't exist. But when we look at the history of Earth, we see that the production of an abundance of oxygen in the atmosphere is a remarkable synthesis of biological, geological, astronomical, uh, atmospheric processes working to produce an, uh, an atmosphere where we can be here and live. You know, I would encourage you to go to reasons.org and check out Hugh's latest blog on this. Deep oxygen cycle provides evidence for the creation of animals. And you'll see the, just the beauty and the, the splendor of this whole process, as well as how it points to the creator who fashioned us so that we can know him, so that you can go out and tell others about this amazing creator. That does it for us this week on 2019. We hope you enjoyed this episode and that it helped equip you to share your faith with confidence and compassion.
And we hope you'll subscribe to the show and also that you will find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We are at 2819 show. If you'd like the podcast version of the show, you can get us on most major podcast services. Just search Reasons to Believe podcast. See you next week.